What's up, tea cats? This is Dylan from Woo Mountain Tea. Today we got chapter three of the masterclass on tea, where we are talking about tea leaf processing. This topic is so important for understanding tea because as we talked about in chapter one, all of the six major tea types, which taste, look, smell so different from one another, they all come from the same unprocessed raw green tea leaf. And it's only through these steps of tea processing that we're gonna talk about today that they become one of the six major tea types. As always, to kick things off, I'm gonna give you the one sentence summary of all the content of this video. Processing of tea does not involve the addition of external ingredients, but rather is the carefully timed implementation of ancient practices such as withering, rolling, bruising, fixing, fermentation, and drying, which transform raw tea leaves into one of the six major tea types. Next, we pluck apart this sentence, process out the details, and filling you out of this video with a crystal clear understanding of tea leaf processing. Alright, so in that one sentence summary, I made a point to include right up front that tea processing doesn't involve the addition of external ingredients or additives, etc. And the reason I did that is because we have this word processing. In today's day and age, we're surrounded by processed foods all the time. People hear processing and they think that it implies the addition of these external chemicals. But in the context of tea, tea processing is, has nothing to do with how the word processing is used in terms of processed foods. And in fact, all of the steps of tea processing that we're gonna go through today have already been in practice for centuries before the industrial era. All the steps in tea processing can be done without electricity, without machinery, and could be done completely by hand. And that's how they have been done for most of history. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each of the six major tea types. We're gonna go through the processing steps for each tea type and explain how each step of each tea type contributes to the formation of that unique tea types taste, color, shape, and aroma. You can see for each of the tea types, there is one step that is in red font, and that is the key step for processing of that tea type, where if you do that one step wrong, you're not gonna end up with a really high quality version of that tea type. To kick things off, I wanna start with white tea. This is kind of known as the simplest among the six major tea types, so I think that's a good one to kick things off with. So the key step in white tea processing is withering. And the objective of white tea processing, you could say, is through extensive withering, we are trying to build a fruity, floral, sweet aroma profile, reduce astringency, while simultaneously enhancing the sweet and savory elements of taste. All right, so you can see with white tea, there's only two steps. We have withering and we have drying. So with withering, it's pretty simple. You're basically just taking the leaves and you're laying them out on the ground to air out, dry out. And what they end up doing is kind of wilting and withering out a little bit, hence the name withering. But the key crucial thing to remember as we start to talk about processing in general, and especially with withering, is that on the left side of this figure, you can see that we're starting with the fresh plucked tea leaf. Now, if you just pluck the tea leaf off of the plant and then you put it on the ground to wither, that tea leaf and the enzymatic processes that are inside of that tea leaf are still very much happening, right? The tea leaf can be said to still be alive and all of the metabolic processes that normally happen in a fully alive tea plant are still happening 
in the tea leaf, even though you've plucked it and removed it from the plant and you have it laying out to wither. And those enzymatic processes that are happening in the fully alive tea plant that are now still happening in the withering leaves are what we actually rely on to create and build the aroma and taste profile of the tea leaves. So now as the leaves are laying out to wither and their metabolic processes are very much still active, what starts happening is that the tea leaves start to sense and respond to an imminent drought stress. They've sensed that there's no more supply of water to the leaves. They start to dry out and air out. What happens is they kick into gear this drought stress response. So if you haven't heard of uh, plant stress, the general gist of it is that Plants, just like animals, just like all walks of life, have to deal with all these stresses that they face in their everyday life, right? No one said being a plant was easy. They got heat stress, they got cold stress, right? If they, get, if they have a frost, they have drought stress, they have, you know, what if the soil gets too acidic? You got pH stress. What if the soil's too salty? You got salt stress, right? Plants, they don't have legs. They can't run away from the drought to, to go to a water bank and, and reroute there. So plants have their own mechanisms, their own ways of responding to all these various stresses that they face as plants. So this is kind of the key aspect of withering. As the tea leaves start responding to the drought stress, they kick into gear their drought stress response. And what happens is tea plants try to deal with these environmental stresses is that they activate all these particular stress response pathways for those enzymes that we were talking about they have to go and mediate these specific stress response functions. And one of those stress response pathways is the activation of the terpenoid metabolic pathway. So the tea plants start creating these tiny little terpenoid molecules. And these terpenoids have a really huge, diverse array of different functions in the plants, but particularly they are produced to help the plants deal with stresses in various ways. But the thing about these terpenoids is that they smell to us really sweet, floral and fruity, right? And so by stressing the plants and having them activate this stress response through the creation of more terpenoids, we are effectively building the aroma profile of the tea leaves. So this is one of the crucial, crucial concepts in tea processing in general, is this stress activation and then letting the plants respond to that stress. We don't wanna overstress the plants if you have too much stress, you actually start to damage those enzymes that we're relying on to create these terpenoids and build the aroma profile of the tea leaves. So the key is just hitting them with these right amounts of stress so that they can activate these stress response pathways, but we can keep kind of that metabolic machinery of the tea leaves intact. Now you have another key thing happening here, which is that as the tea leaves wither, the tea leaf cells start to break down. And what happens there is that under normal circumstances, tea leaves have the enzymes and the molecules that those enzymes act on. Each enzyme has its critical target molecule that it acts on. That's called the substrate for that enzyme. So the enzymes and the substrates are usually kept in separate compartments within the tea leaf cell because you don't want the enzymes just running around and doing their enzymatic thing and changing all of these molecules without strict regulation by the tea plant. So they're normally kept apart. In your house, you might keep the matches and the lighters away from the gasoline. You might keep the plugged in toaster oven away from the full bathtub type of thing, right? But in the tea leaf, during withering, the barriers that hold these two separate start to break down. So you basically have the enzymes meeting with their substrate and basically all hell breaks loose in the tea leaf and all these metabolic processes get kicked into gear. So I'm gonna name a couple of these really critical enzyme mediated processes that get activated as we're withering the tea leaves. Number one, there's aroma molecules that are bound to sugars. Sugars function as like locks on molecules in plant cells. When a sugar is locked on to a molecule, it's not reactive. And so there's special enzymes that unlock and take off that sugar from the molecule that it's attached to. So during withering, there's all these different unique aroma molecules that are attached to sugars. And then these enzymes come in and take off the lock and break apart the aroma molecule from the sugar molecule. That does two things. It builds the aroma profile even more, creating more richer, deeper, more complex aromas, 
but it's also releasing those free sugar molecules, those soluble sugar molecules, which enhance the sweetness and the mouthfeel of tea taste. So that's one huge enzyme mediated process here is the, is the removal of the sugars from their aroma molecules. So another big one is these protease enzymes. Proteases are enzymes that chop up other proteins and proteins are built of amino acids in long chains and then the amino acids fold up and form the proteins. But when you have these proteases wreaking havoc on the free proteins in the tea leaf cell, you basically have the the cleaving off of all these free amino acids. And you'll remember from chapter two that these free amino acids are what build that sweet and umami, savory component of tea taste. So the actions of these proteases build the umami, savory, sweet components of tea taste during withering. Number three, kind of like number two, is that you have cellulase enzymes. And these, just like the protease, enzymes with proteins, these cellulases, they go and break down long chains of carbohydrates into single carbohydrate monomers, which are sugars. So you're turning insoluble, tasteless cellulose carbohydrates into more soluble sugars. So that again, more soluble sugars builds and enhances the sweetness and also enhances the mouthfeel. It adds a new layer of richness and fullness to the mouthfeel. All right, lastly, enzyme process number four that gets activated during withering. We have in tea leaves these polyphenol oxidase enzymes. And this may actually be the most important enzyme mediated process in tea leaf processing in general. So this is a process called catechin oxidation where these PPO enzymes are taking these catechins, which exist in huge abundance in tea leaves. You'll remember from chapter two, right? We talked, that was the first thing we talked about in terms of important tea molecules, these catechin molecules. When tea catechins get oxidized by these uh, PPO enzymes, they first form dimers. Dimers, just two catechins kind of mashed together, right? They form a, a tea catechin dimer. That's called theoflavins. You also have theosinensins. You have these various ways that the catechins can be oxidized and then mashed together. Um, that's kind of the first step of tea catechin oxidation. And then they can further mash into each other and create these larger molecular structures called theorubigins. So in the names of these molecules, actually, there's an indication of their color, right? Theoflavin, flavus means golden. So the theoflavins and the theosinensins, these are golden colored. And then theorubigins, ruby means red. So these kind of get darker and really red colored. And this is why black tea is red in color actually. And then after theorubigins, if they continue to mash together and oxidize and condense and polymerize, then they form theobrownins. And that's even more oxidation than a normal black tea. And you really see theobrownins only in ripe Puer tea. And these things are just jet black and really, really silky smooth on the palate. So what I just laid out there is the general spiel of tea catechin oxidation. Catechins oxidized to theoflavins oxidized to theorubigins oxidized to theobrownins. All right. So that is a huge, huge, hugely important enzymatic process which affects many different types of tea processing. And this process is just another one of the enzymatic processes that get kicked into gear during tea weathering. All right, so at this point in the video, you might be thinking, Dylan, this is the first step of the first tea type. What is happening here? Don't worry, not every step of every tea type is gonna be this complex. Withering, it's just a good opportunity to introduce some of these really critical concepts that we're gonna be using again and tons of different steps of a lot of different tea types. So the more we go on and the more we get behind us in terms of concepts and terminology, the easier it's gonna be. So just bear with me here. Now let's get back to withering. So we have the drought stress. We have the floral fruity sweet aroma formation. We have the enhancement of the tea savory sweet characteristics, right? And we also have the reduction in overall astringency of the tea through catechin oxidation. All of this, all this enzymatic pandemonium is simply happening as a result of laying the tea leaves out to wither and dry. That's kind of crazy, right? Now, on top of drought stress during withering, we can get the tea leaves under the sun, right? If it's a sunny day, if you're lucky enough to have good weather, you can get the tea leaves under the sun for a little bit. And that adds a whole new dimension of stress, which is UV irradiation stress. 
And that has whole new aroma forming systems that are activated in the tea leaves as a result of getting under the sun, getting a little bit of a new stress type added to tea leaf processing. We've done this long, long withering step, right? White tea withering can take two to three days depending on cultivar, depending on season and the weather outside. All these impact the enzyme activity of tea plants. And as we mentioned, the enzymes are running the show here. Right? All these flavor formation processes are, at the end of the day, a result of T enzyme activity. So the length of time for withering depends on these various environmental and genetic factors that affect enzyme activity. All right, so let's move on. So that was the first step of the first tea type, but like I said, it will get easier as we go along. Step two, the last step of white tea processing is drying. So the function of drying is twofold. So the first important thing to get done with drying is to bring the water content of the tea leaves down below 5%. If the leaves still have a high moisture content, it is too easy for mold to grow. And so the tea leaves aren't stable for storage and transport. So that's the first important function of, of tea leaf drying is to get that water content below 5%. But the second crucial function of drying is actually that it provides a new opportunity for us to build new flavor and to, and to form new aroma compounds in the tea leaves. So if you're really into the culinary sciences and food sciences in general, you may have heard of Maillard reaction compounds. And these are simply the products formed when you take amino acids and you have sugars and you add heat bring them together and they form these new compounds. You can imagine it's a savory element and a sweet element coming together with heat. So you can think of like that smell of sweet barbecue. It's really just this a meaty mouth watering aroma. And you get the formation of these Maillard reaction products during drying. If you use the right temperature and time, if you use too high a temperature, you don't get the same formation of these aroma compounds. So during drying, if you get a nice low-ish temperature, prolonged drying, then you can really even enhance the aroma on top of what already happened during withering. So those are the two key things to know about tea drying is, is getting below 5% water weight and then also for trying the best you can to form these new aroma compounds. All right, so that was the first tea type. We got white tea behind us. We are moving on to the next tea type down on our little figure here, which is oolong tea. The key step in oolong tea is bruising. And the overall objective with oolong tea is to build and create this multi-layered complex aroma profile, right? Oolong is all about aroma. And we're doing this using plant stress, which we've already talked about. So with oolong processing, we start things off by withering, but oolong withering is way shorter than white tea withering. White tea withering is like two days. Oolong withering is like six hours. After we wither them, we have the tea leaves laying on these bamboo mats, or we have them in kind of a big uh, tumbler thing. So for about one to two minutes at a time, we're lightly tossing around the tea leaves, and then we let them sit for about an hour. And then we come back and we do it again. So bruising encompasses both the physical movement of the tea leaves, but also the resting. Here we're adding a new stress. This is called wounding stress, which is physical hitting of the tea leaves. That's why we call it bruising. And you know, the analogy with, with bruising in humans is actually not bad because if you ever gotten a big bruise before, it was the physical impact of getting hit, but then it was time after the physical impact that formed the bruise. The process of bruising is impact plus time. So during oolong bruising, we're doing between four and eight cycles of this wounding and then resting, and then wounding and then resting. And the wounding is about two minutes long, you know, very short, but the resting is about an hour long. And that's really when aroma formation from that wounding stress happens. The tea leaves aren't building the aroma during the stress itself. You give the stress to induce and to trigger the response, which then occurs over that hour long time frame of, of resting. So with bruising, one of the key things that's happening is that catechin oxidation, right? You have more of those PPO enzymes leaking out of their, of their compartments and they're interacting with catechins and encouraging the further formation of those oxidized T catechins that we talked about with withering. So you'll see during oolong here, the, the leaves will really start to get red, right? This is the bruising of the oolong tea. So actually one cool thing that I noticed about bruising in recent years is that in addition to this wounding stress, some tea masters will add an air conditioning unit in their bruising room. They'll turn the AC down really low 
and that actually adds a whole new dimension of cold stress to the tea leaves. And there's specific aroma compounds that are only activated and only created through cold stress responses in tea leaves. So if you can add this extra layer, this extra dimension of stress, you get even richer and more complex aroma formation with the oolong tea leaves. So we're stressing the leaves, we're letting the aroma continue to build, the catechins are being oxidized, that reduces the astringency, and then also you have more of those cellulase and protease enzymes continuing to do their work in the tea leaves, building the sweet and savory components of oolong tea taste. Now, at a certain point in time, after we do between four to eight cycles of bruising and resting, we're gonna have the oolong tea leaves at the exact degree of oxidation and the exact state of aroma formation that we want them. And it's at this point that we actually wanna stop the enzymatic activity within the tea leaves. The enzymes have been busy at work, doing a great job oxidizing and building aroma, but now we want them to stop, right? We wanna freeze this aroma and taste profile in time by stopping the activity of the tea leaf enzymes. And so this, brings us to our next step in oolong tea processing, which is fixing. With fixing, the premise is very simple here. We're, we're just adding really high heat to the tea leaves to denature and degrade those enzymes that were mediating all of those various processes. And by adding heat and denaturing these enzymes, we effectively take the aroma and taste profile and we freeze them right in their tracks. Right, so there's no more transformation of taste and aroma through these enzymatic processes. All right, so after we have fixed the tea leaves, then we are going to roll. So there's two main purposes in rolling. And the first one is that you want to disrupt the tea leaf cells a bit and kind of break down the tea leaves so that later when you're infusing the tea leaves, tea leaves that have been rolled will release the flavor compounds more easily. And five of the six major tea types get rolled, the odd man out being white tea. So white tea doesn't get rolled and you'll see when you're preparing white tea, you need hotter temperatures of water and longer infusion times to really extract and pull out all of the flavor from white tea leaves. So the first function of rolling is aiding in the extraction of flavor later during tea preparation. But the second critical function of rolling, which is really key for black tea, which we'll talk about in a second, is that you are further breaking down those barriers that separate the enzymes from their substrates, right? What we talked about in withering, that is true to a certain degree when you just let the tea leaves dry out and air out, but you really take that concept of mixing enzymes and substrate to a whole different level when you're actually pressing and rolling and, and mashing the tea leaves out. So in a tea like black tea, when you really are relying on those enzymes to oxidize the tea catechins and, and mediate all these different processes, you really want to have maximal interaction between enzyme and substrate. And it's through rolling that we really accelerate and catalyze that mixing of enzymes and substrate. So that's the second major function of rolling. After rolling with oolong tea, then we are ready to dry and you have heard my spiel on drying already, so we don't need to cover that one again, and we can move right on to black tea processing. All right, so the key step in black tea processing is called fermentation, and the larger objective in black tea processing can be said to be encouraging the oxidation of tea catechins into these theoflavins and theorubigins, these larger, darker, more complex molecules that reduce the astringency of the tea infusion, right? The, the characteristic profile of black tea taste is sweet, smooth, not astringent, and ruby red, like a rich, deep red color. So it's really the catechin oxidation that we're, that we're targeting with black tea processing, and that's gonna help us attain our goals of producing a really high grade black tea. So kicking things off with black tea, we have a wither which is similar to oolong withering, not nearly as long as white tea withering. It's, got, it's, it's like a six to eight hour wither for black tea, depending on those withering factors that I mentioned before. Then we roll the tea leaves. And like I just said, with rolling for black tea, you're doing it kind of with more pressure and for a longer time than with oolong or other tea types because we really want to encourage the mixing of enzyme and substrate. Now, after rolling, we move on to our key black tea processing step, which is fermentation. Now, the goal with fermentation is really to create the optimal environment for the mixing of enzymes 
and substrate. In particular, we want those oxidase enzymes, those PPO enzymes to mix with the tea catechins so that we can efficiently form theoflavins and theorubigans. So during fermentation to optimize for PPO activity, we are taking the tea leaves, we're piling them up in these baskets, and then you wanna increase the humidity of the room. Usually in these fermentation rooms, you'll see a humidifier blasting uh, moist air into the room. You wanna keep humidity like above 90% if possible. And so that's obviously really helpful in encouraging that enzymatic activity, right? Enzymes like humidity. And sometimes they'll even take like a wet cloth and lay it on top of the baskets of the fermenting black tea leaves to make the conditions even more moist and optimal for tea catechin oxidation. And then another critical thing for black tea fermentation is that you, you wanna make sure the leaves have sufficient access to oxygen, right? You can't oxidize a catechin without oxygen. It's easy sometimes when you're trying to increase humidity and kind of pile things up and heat them up to make a condition or an environment inside the pile which is deprived of oxygen. And that will actually cause more of a rotting, smelly fermentation rather than a sweet, floral, fruity fermentation that comes where there's sufficient oxygen so those oxidase enzymes can do their oxidizing. There's a point of fermentation where you have reached the peak level of theoflavin and theorubigans that you want. And then if you continue to oxidize and ferment after that, they degrade and they and you start to lose those compounds that you're that you're trying to target. But at a certain point, you'll reach your perfect oxidation fermentation degree. And then you take the tea leaves and then you dry them. And you have already heard my drying spiel. So we can move right along to our fourth major tea type, which is green tea. So the key step of green tea processing is fixing. And that's the first one that we do. And the primary objective of green tea processing, you could say is to halt enzyme activity immediately after plucking so that you preserve the natural green color and aroma qualities while maintaining kind of a crisp, fresh green taste. Let's start with fixing. That's the first step in green tea processing. All right, so like we mentioned with oolong, the goal, the objective in fixing is to halt enzyme activity, to denature those enzymes in tea leaves. But there's more than one way to fix a tea leaf. And the method that you employ to fix the tea leaves actually has a huge impact on the final aroma and taste profile of those tea leaves. And we talked about this in chapter one. This is one of the major distinctions between different types and subtypes of green tea is how they were fixed. So the two main methods are through pan firing, which is bigger in China, and then you have steaming, which is bigger in Japan. There's new experiments happening all the time where they're trying out new fixation methods. I saw one the other day that's using hot, dry air to fix the tea leaves. That created a whole new aroma and taste profile in the green tea. I mean, in the laboratory, when we're extracting compounds from tea leaves, we have to fix them after we pluck and we just use a microwave, <laughs> a kitchen microwave in the lab. But the primary difference between those two major types, pan firing and steaming, is that steaming creates more of a grassy, vegetal, green aroma profile. Whereas the pan firing, which is more common in China, creates more of a toasty, nutty aroma. And sort of the pinnacle of aroma traits with pan fired green tea is the chestnut aroma. So if you ever meet a Chinese tea master and you're trying their green tea and you wanna pay them the highest possible compliment you can, tell them that you're getting a chestnut aroma from their green tea and you will see the biggest grin come across their face. You will, you will absolutely make their day if you tell them that. So that's kind of, you can think of that, uh, that fresh roasted chestnut as, the, as perfection of pan fired green tea, whereas steaming, you, you wanna preserve as green of a profile as you can. All right, so after we have fixed the green tea leaves, you have a roll followed by a dry. And you have heard my rolling spiel and my drying spiel at this point, so we can move right along to the fifth major tea type, which is yellow tea. All right, so the key step in yellow tea processing is a step that's called yellowing. And the goal of yellow tea processing is to create some of the fresh and green aroma characteristics of green tea, but at the same time through this yellowing step to reduce the astringency and increase the sweet and savory elements of taste. With yellow tea, the first step is fixing, and it's similar to green tea fixing, but we are using slightly lower temperatures 
during yellow tea fixing than green tea fixing because we want to denature the enzymes, but we don't want to denature 100% of the enzymes. In yellow tea fixing, we want to get like 95% of the enzymes. And you'll see why in a second when we get to the yellowing step. So after yellow tea fixing, then we move on to rolling. And you've heard my spiel on rolling, I think. I think you have. So let's move on right to this key step, which is yellowing. So the idea with yellowing is that you are kind of pile heaping up the tea leaves, kind of like we did with black tea fermentation. You're kind of heaping the tea leaves up and we're creating an environment for certain changes to occur. So there's three main processes happening with this yellowing step. One is that some of the tea catechins will get oxidized through a non-enzymatic way. So actually oxygen from the air can just spontaneously react with catechins and oxidize them that way. It's much less efficient and it happens at a much slower rate than enzymatic oxidation, but nonetheless, it does contribute to some degree of catechin oxidation during this yellowing step. The second key thing here is that the 5% of innate tea leaf enzymes that we did preserve through that lower fixing temperature, those are oxidizing catechins and inducing some degree of change in the tea leaves. We are getting a bit just a bit of enzymatic oxidation here. And then there's also some other cellulase and protease activity here, which is enhancing that sweet and savory component of tea taste and reducing the astringency. Now, the third major process that's happening during tea yellowing is that you have microbial communities that were in the air or on the leaves themselves they kind of settle onto the tea leaves and they start to use their own microbial enzymes to go and break down some of those longer carbohydrates and those proteins in tea leaves the same way that innate tea leaf enzymes work. So you can kind of think of yellowing of tea as like similar to the fermentation step in black tea, but the changes that are happening are much slower because you have eliminated most of the effects of the innate enzymes in tea leaves themselves. And then you have this added component of microbial activities. So yellowing happens over the course of like six to eight hours. And through this, the tea leaves change from a greenish color to a yellowish color obviously as the name implies, and then you have reduced astringency and improved sweetness and savory components due to non-enzymatic oxidation, some degree of enzymatic oxidation, but mostly these microbial communities that are taking residence on the leaves and catalyzing these reactions that enhance taste. So after yellowing is done, then we dry the tea leaves, and I'm pretty sure that you have heard my spiel on drawing. Have you heard? I have a drawing spiel. Have you heard, have you heard it? I, don't, I, think, I think you've heard it. We'll move on to the sixth and final major tea type, which is dark tea. So the key step in dark tea processing is called post-fermentation. And the larger objective in dark tea processing is to, through post-fermentation, significantly reduce the astringency of the tea leaves and enhance the sweet and savory components of tea leaf taste. That may have sounded like the goal of yellow tea, but the key difference there was significantly. So the post-fermentation kind of is analogous to yellowing, but we just do it to a much greater degree. And so we'll dive into that in just a second. Step one of dark tea, we kick things off with a fixing. And this is just like yellow tea fixing. We're doing slightly lower temperatures than green tea fixing in the same way and for the same reasons as yellow tea fixing. We're trying to preserve just a little piece of tea leaf enzymatic activity. And then we roll, and then we move into post-fermentation. So you're still heaping the leaves in a pile, just like we did with yellowing, but the differentiator here is time. We are letting the tea leaves sit in this pile for more like two days, rather than six to eight hours for yellowing. And what happens during that time is that the tea leaves go beyond just yellowing and they kind of fully brown. And the browning occurs through, just like yellow tea, through some degree of non-enzymatic oxidation, through some degree of residual enzyme activity from the tea leaves, but importantly, through microbial activities. Now, as we mentioned in chapter one, there's different types of dark tea which are super different from one another. We mentioned just with pu'er tea, which is kind of the most famous type of dark tea, you have raw pu'er and ripe pu'er. And these look, smell, taste totally different from each other. And it all comes down to this post-fermentation step. So with more raw style of dark teas, 
this post fermentation step is only gonna take like two or three days and the leaves get brown, but a significant degree of the tea catechins kind of still remain unoxidized or unchanged. So you preserve more of that green tea style, more brisk, more crisp of a taste profile. Whereas dark teas that are similar to ripe puer, that post fermentation step can take up to two months or more. And those microbial communities that are acting on the tea leaves are allowed to do their microbial thing for two full months, which significantly alters, changes, oxidizes, condenses, polymerizes, completely transforms the biochemical properties of the tea leaves. So you can see with dark teas, it really is all about that post-fermentation. How much change do you allow the tea leaves to undergo during that post-fermentation step. If it's a lighter, a lesser degree of change, like the raw puer tea, then after dark tea processing is done, you take those dark tea bricks or those teas and you put them in storage. And storage of those raw dark teas allows even more microbial and enzymatic changes to take place. So it's like you're kind of saving some change in the tea leaves for later. We're not gonna change everything during post-fermentation now. We're gonna stop the changes a little bit early and then let more changes occur during storage. Whereas for ripe puer, you're like, I wanna get all the changes done before I even finish processing the tea leaves, right? So that post-fermentation is really thorough. And then when you take a ripe dark tea, and put it in storage, there's less change to be had during storage. And you can really see the degree of change that's happened during post-fermentation by just looking at the color of the infused tea liquor. Before, when we were talking about tea catechin oxidation, we said theoflavins, theorubigins, and then that final end product of tea catechin oxidation is these theobrownins, which as the name implies is brown. And so that's really the characteristic compound in ripe puer, and you get the formation of those theobrownins during post-fermentation. So by the time that ripe puer is finished, you already have all these theobrownins, and the soup color of the tea is really thick, rich, and jet black. Whereas with the more raw teas, you don't form all of those theobrownins up front during post-fermentation. Rather, you put it on the shelf and let those form more slowly over years and years of time. So I hope that makes sense. A lot of people get confused with this post-fermentation thing. Um, if you have questions, just comment below and I'll definitely respond to any questions you might have. But um, that was generally the gist of post-fermentation. Now after post-fermentation of dark tea, then we dry. And there kind of is maybe you could think of like an optional last step of dark tea, which is aging. Those more raw, less post-fermented dark teas, you almost always wanna age those for a few years after they're done being processed. But technically after you finish drying, then the processing of dark tea is done. So that was every single step of every single tea type. If you have stuck with me in this video from the beginning until now, Congratulations, you have learned so much about tea processing. We've talked about all of the major tea types, all the steps involved, and even dove pretty deep into the biochemical processes that are underlying the transformation of these raw tea leaves in each tea type that create the unique aroma, taste, color, and shape of the six major tea types. So that's it for chapter three. Chapter four, we are diving into a formal tea assessment. I'm taking one really high grade green tea and a supermarket bought green tea bag, which is basically the lowest of the low in terms of tea. And I'm taking these and we're doing a full comparison of one to the other. And it's gonna show you the entire process of how to conduct a formal tea tasting using a standardized set of procedures to assess objectively the taste, aroma, color, and shape of tea leaves. All right, tea cats, so that is it for today's video. Until next time, stay healthy, stay positive, and keep sipping tea. One love.